know Peter Abdel Mesa. He is one of our top agents, not the top agent, but one of the top agents at Team Provident. <laughs> we'll see if uh, this year he changes that. Um, he's been in business for what, four years now? No, no so five years in. Um, the top agent is Tessa, who was supposed to also be joining us. So she did want to apologize that she couldn't join us because she had a family emergency. Yeah, uh, yeah I want to talk to you guys a little bit more about how that friendship is. Thank you, Nazar, for introducing me. Um, so basically, as I've been in business for about five years, I don't come from real estate background or anything, but I jumped in, joined the team, and it kickstarted my career, helped me skip over years of learning, hundreds and tens of thousands of dollars worth of mistakes that could have been made. Um, but the most important thing, and this is what I wanted to talk about today, is having an accountability partner, right? So through being here, I got to meet a lot of great people. I got to meet Tessa, who is my accountability partner, and we're super close friends. And so the main thing that comes with that is that you have to find an accountability partner that is not going to believe your own bullshit. And excuse me for cussing a little bit. Um, but we are salespeople. Naturally, we are meant to sell. And what that means is that we start to believe our own excuses and everything that we tell each other. So when you find an accountability partner, they have to be someone that is not going to be a yes man, someone that's not going to be one of those to believe the BS that you try to sell them, right? And so I made some slides. If I could share the screen here, let me show you this. All right, can everybody see this, uh, the slides or not? Can you see the screen, see the slides? Looks good. All right, excellent. So with that being said, essentially the accountability partner that you have to find is someone, like I said, that is gonna hold you accountable. Someone that will call you on what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, and mainly wants you to succeed. Someone that is going to ask you questions about your business and you're gonna answer them honestly without trying to give them some BS. So with Tessa and I, we actually have a call every seven, every, sorry, every morning, seven to 7.30. And these are some of the topics that we discuss, right? Yes, we're friends. Yes, we BS sometimes and we talk about random stuff, but most importantly, we do hold each other accountable. What I've seen that do to my production and to hers is in the last three to four years that, you know, we've gotten close over time. Her production has gone up a significant amount, which I used to be the top agent at one point in time. And then I lost the throne, as Nazar mentioned earlier. Uh, and so what we talk about on that is what are we committed to doing, right? It is a business. You have to treat it as such. And so you have to share your commitments. You have to have someone that's going to hold you accountable to that. So we've both transitioned more into dealing with listings over time rather than buyers, but you do still have to have that balance of working with both sets of clients in order to have a balanced business, right? We talk about our calendars. What are we going to be doing for the week? Most important thing in real estate, and every coach says that everybody knows that you have to make contacts, you have to make you know new friends, you have to have some conversations with people in order to earn that business. And the business is going to continue regardless if you're out there doing the calls or not, someone else is. So we hold each other accountable for that where we want to have 10 conversations per day in order for us to meet our transactional goals, right? That is at a minimum. What you should do is take your business plan work backwards on what you want to produce for the year, and then break that down to how many days you're going to prospect, how many conversations you're going to have, and work with your calendar and see how you're going to end up doing so. Okay. The next thing is, what messages are you putting out there about the market? We all know that social media has been a big thing. You have to become the knowledge broker. You have to be on Instagram. You have to be on TikTok, whatever platforms that you use. But ultimately, you have to be out there putting out information. Us as agents, we're up against different news sources. We're up against different information that's being spread around. And so you have to be the knowledge broker. So we share ideas around that, what we can make videos about, what we can talk to our clients about and become that broker that people turn to rather than turning on Fox News or whatever news source that they're gonna turn to, right? We then go into what pieces of content. So specifically, we actually go into detail about captions, posts, what we're gonna talk about and what we can put out for that week and how that will channel in new business to us or capture our sphere into coming to us for real estate uh, need, right? Another big thing, so you've heard about it, doing the CMA a day, that honestly is a lot. I cannot keep up with the CMA a day. I know Tessa as well has not been able to, so narrow it down to the numbers that work for you. We do about two to three CMAs every week. Now, where do we go for that? As people that we have sold houses to in the last you know, four or five years, we're reaching out to those people. We're reaching out to them and explaining their equity position, their interest rates, what it would look like if they moved, 
big thing is during COVID, a lot of people settled because of the amount of competition that you have for houses. So they gave up what they're looking for. They gave up a lot of big major things that they had initially in their home search criteria. So you could reach out to those people and explain what their move would look like if they were to do it today, right? And last but not least is who are you going to have coffee with this week? We're in a relationship business, so you want to definitely go in and have those conversations and you want to get on a personal level with people, right? Another thing that I wanted to talk about, and this was mainly going to be Tessa's portion, I will be completely honest with you guys, I had a farm and it was an absolute disaster. Um, I was not consistent with it. I took on way too many people and went to a farm of about 2,100 homes. So don't recommend that. I highly recommend that you choose a farm that you're going to be committed to being the mayor of. And I know Nazar is like the king of farming. Uh, this is actually a lot of his advice. Tessa followed it and killed it. Last year, she had 13 transactions that came from her farm. She lives in a gated community, about 700 homes. She sends out two postcards a month, um, followed the same strategy, and was able to basically capture all of that business. Now, her main source of business in that farm has come from the older generation. So with this, I know postcards are a big thing. A lot of agents usually will send out one or two and they stop because it is expensive, it is pricey. However, the biggest thing is being consistent. You're not gonna be familiar until you do eight different touches to people. So in the first eight weeks, you have to send one postcard a week, right? That's gonna get your name out there. That's gonna make it where you're familiar. People start seeing your face and they start becoming curious, who is this person and why are they mailing to me so much? And then every week after, I'm sorry, every month after that, you send about one to two postcards a month. So that way they're getting valuable information. Nazar's method is you send out one postcard that's about what's going on locally, what's happening in the area. And then the second one is a market update, what's sold in the area, what are the market stats, what does that mean for your home value? And then a call to action whether that be a QR code, whether that be give us a call, you know, call for a free valuation, whatever that may be, that's what people are going to act on, right? Another big thing that is coming into play is the digital aspect of things. A lot of people through COVID learn to use QR codes, learn to use the internet for everything. So make sure to incorporate that into your farm. It's not just sending out postcards and then hoping that you're going to get calls, it's being involved in your community. And, you know, hopefully we'll have another call where Tessa can hop on and she could share a lot more about what she does with the farm. Um, but she's involved in her community. She's at local events. She's sponsoring some of the events in her community, running, you know, donation drives, doing all different kinds of things to get her name out there. So you have to do that, but you have to be consistent with it. You may not see a call. And this chick has, she has like her picture in the background. <laughs> um, so you may not see any results from a farm or from postcards for the first six months sometimes even up to a year. So make sure that you're consistent with it. Do not give up, but be prepared because it is a big expense. There is another aspect of it where it's the demographic farming. And this is more recent where meet with your title company, but basically you could pick a specific audience that you want to target and you're going to heavily focus on that. If you're targeting a younger generation or mostly on social media or mostly on you know Yelp, Google, whatever social platforms, you're gonna run ads in that sense. You're gonna go in and put in Google ads. You could get very specific with what you do. And you can also manage the budget that you're comfortable with. Not everybody has, you know, two, $3,000 a month to spend on sending out 500 or 600 postcards, but you could go on Google and then you could set that very specific budget for what you're comfortable with. And it's great because people go on their phones. We spend a lot of time on these things. They start seeing your face. They start seeing your ads. That's how you're gonna capture them. And they want you want them to think, real estate, I coordinate it to Peter, I coordinate it to whoever you are in your market, right? So with that, make sure that you're picking a very specific farm and you have to be very consistent. No matter what you do, don't focus on it being perfect. Don't focus on how does this postcard look? How does this video look? If you look at me, I realize I don't have hair. My nose is a little bit crooked, but at the end of the day, when I make a video, just post it. People are watching the video. They're looking for the content. They don't care about how I look, how I sound, or anything else around it. They don't care how perfect or imperfect it is, All right? So just be consistent, make sure that you're posting and you are really just focusing about serving others. It's not about you. It's only about the people that you're serving in your target audience. And so last thing that we did want to talk about with our call, and it's the most important thing, which is how you treat clients, right? Whenever people are getting a new lead or a new client that's coming through their system, whether it's an online lead, whether it's a referral, however that may come out. A lot of agents just focus on doing a transaction. They don't focus on the relationship aspect of it. They don't focus on building a friendship with that person. 
which is the most important thing. Yes, we're salespeople, but more importantly, we are in a relationship business. You get paid to talk, right? So if you're getting out there and you're practicing on a client, it is the absolute worst mistake that you can make. If you're not prepared with what to say, how to say it, your body language, and what you're going to do to get across to that person, you are going to lose them. And just think of it as basically, I don't know, whatever everybody's commission ranges are in their respective areas, but it's a $10,000 paycheck walking away from you because you cannot have a good conversation with that person, right? Now, if you guys look at Tom Ferry, or if you guys pay attention to Tom Ferry, you will know who Phil Jones is. This is a book I highly, highly recommend. It's a short, simple read. If you don't have a long attention span, it's easy, big text, no pictures, just straight to the point. But buy this book, read it, because it will completely change how you think of things. And one big thing that Phil Jones talks about is motivation. And what exactly is the meaning of motivation? And you think about this in any aspect of your life. Everybody has something that is going to be either one, painful enough for them to run away from it, or two, it's going to be exciting enough for them to take action and make that happen. You just think about that in any situation. If there isn't something that's painful enough or exciting enough, no one is going to take action and they're just going to sit back and let things be. So how do you find out the motivation for your clients in order for you to help them in their real estate needs? You have to go through three simple steps, right? Number one is you have to stay curious long enough for you to be able to be empathetic of their situation. And once you're empathetic of their situation, you're going to build up the courage for you to be able to give them advice. Right now, I'm going to explain that a little bit more in detail with your questions. Don't ask, you know, when are you looking to move? Are you pre-approved? Things like that. Those are simple questions that will scare somebody away from you. And if you've ever been to a Tom Ferry event, I know a lot of people here are part of that ecosystem and they go to the conferences. Tom Ferry makes a joke of it, but it's 100% true. He says, hi, I'm Tom. Sex? That's exactly how a lot of agents sound when they go to meet a client right? They're jumping the gun. They're not asking enough questions. They're not working their way to the close. They're just worried so much about getting to the transaction and getting to the close. So what you have to do is you have to be curious enough to ask enough questions about your client and find out what is important to them. If you do that, a person will tell you what's important to them, when to sell to them, how you're going to sell to them, and most importantly, what is going to potentially make them change their whole search criteria because it's the one important aspect to it. Right? So someone will tell you, I want a nice house, I want a nice school, I want a nice kitchen. But if the house has that one thing that they're looking for, and it's out of the area, it's out of the different school districts that they're looking at, they will potentially make that jump and make some sacrifices in order to take that home. You have to be curious enough to know what that one thing is that's most important to the client. And when you find out their situation, you find out their motivation, then you could be empathetic of their situation and put yourself in their shoes. What happens when you put yourself in their shoes? You start to think about what would be most important to me if I were in that scenario. And then you build the courage after you know that to give advice in one specific way. I don't know what these green lines are across the screen, but right here where it's in red, if you cannot talk to a client and say, because of the fact that you said blank, I recommend A, B, and C, you did not ask them enough questions and you need to go back to step one where you're finding out more questions in order to advise them right? Sales is not about just showing a house. It's not about just doing the basic things. It's about getting to know your client and being able to build a relationship with them in order for you to give advice in that format, right? And what that does for you is in the process of getting to know them, you will build a friendship with them. You will show them that you understand them. And at the end of the day, that is how your clients will truly become your friends for life. Why is that important? Because we're in a relationship business where most of your clients after you close, should not be forgotten, should not be where they never think of who you are again, they don't remember you. It should be where they like you enough and they trust you enough and they built a good enough relationship with you through that transaction in order for them to invite you to family parties, invite you to the housewarming party, right? What that does for you is based on how things should break down, how your business should break down for the next year when you're planning, 10% of your clients should be sending you referrals. So if you have 100 past clients, you should easily be getting 10 transactions just from that. How do you do that? You've gotten to know them well enough when you have them on social media, when you have them over at you know, events that you have, you're inviting them to whatever the you know, event that you're hosting is going to be. You are able to connect with them because you got to know through their home search what's important to them, what their kids like, what you know, they like, what they enjoy, and you're able to give them gifts accordingly. You're able to speak with them about a conversation that's going to matter to them, and it's not just sales-focused.
So make sure you guys are taking that time because that's how you're going to get a client. You're going to build a relationship with them. You're going to sell them a home. They're going to be friends. And when they have a good experience with you, they'll refer three to five people to you in the years to come. All right, so that is all that I had prepared for you guys. I wanted to leave it open for questions. If you wanted to connect with me, I do have a QR code here. It'll show you my Instagram, Facebook, Zillow, every profile that you could want. My direct number is on there. If you have any questions, if you want any information on the Phil Jones book or anything like that, I have that all. I'm more than happy to share it with you guys. So if there are any questions, yeah, that, please feel free. That was great. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, sure. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, in this market that we're in today, Yes. How do you feel agents that have never been in a down market like yourself can be productive and and not get stuck in the, the, the mindset that there's nobody doing transactions? You know, that is a very good question. So last year I did over 45 transactions and this year it's been off to a horrible start. I'm not on track to even meet that. And so what I would say is going back to the basics. We try to overcomplicate things. And I talked about it with my coach where he said, Stop worrying about the new thing. Stop worrying about the new shiny, you know, thing to do on TikTok, Instagram dances, all that stuff. You got to go back to the basics. Basics of real estate are becoming the knowledge broker, making sure that you simplify everything and you are just consistent with what you're doing. So what I'm doing this year differently is I'm focusing on becoming the knowledge broker. And what I mean by that is taking the time to learn what's going on in the market. What are the signs and explain that to my clients, explain that to my sphere where I give the basic overview, but then I say, how does this affect you? And I've been getting a lot of results from that on my social media. I've been getting a lot of people that have been reaching out to me, asking more details about that. We've had the dream program. We've had interest rates more than double in the last six months. And so with that being said, if you explain that and how it relates to people, people will come to you. You got to go back to picking up the phone and making phone calls. In the last two to three years, we've been spoiled. People would just call you, say, I want a house. I'm approved for this much, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You're basically taking orders, giving them homes, and then you close, move on to the next. So going back to the basics, building that relationship, getting to know the clients, making your calls, and going back to the prospecting that most of us are probably guilty of getting away from in the last two to three years. Awesome. Robert. Awesome, Peter. Thanks for sharing, man. You've obviously come a long way in four years. And I love how you started it by saying, uh, you know, you saved yourself hundreds of thousands of dollars in in, in, in mistakes by joining the czar and just kind of being a sponge. So congratulations to you, bro. Um, you. I have a question around the accountability, um, a, a few parts. You know, one thing that's challenging is when you become close with somebody, it is really easy to let them off the hook. So I'm curious to know, like, when, when one of you don't do what you say you're going to do, how does that go? What's the punishment look like if there is a punishment? And how often do you guys meet? Like, how, like give us some behind the scenes around that, because that's something that I'm working on with my team and, and accountability, even with myself is important. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about, like, let's dive a little deeper into that. Absolutely. So with my self accountability, I've learned that I've become good enough at sales to where I start believing my own bullshit. And so with Tessa, the good thing about her is that she was also guilty of that. And we've realized that. So when we're talking to each other, if I tell her, oh yeah, I'm going to do this, you know, I, I want to do this. I have plans to do this. Her follow-up question to that is when? When is it going to be done by? And that's where we've both seen the biggest change is that before it would just be like, oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks, bro. That's awesome. Great job. Now it's when is it done? And if it's not done, we do talk smack to each other. Um, we don't put, you know, financial bet on the line or anything like that, but we might start doing that because we started slacking off a little bit. So I know a couple of people in our office, for example, they have $100 a week where you're going to do A, B, and C. If you don't do it, you're going to give up that 100 bucks right? We might start doing that. If $100 isn't going to hurt you enough, up the ante and make it 1000 make it 5000 right? Where you're going to have to have what you want to do. You got to get really detailed about when the deadline for that is. And then you could even go as far as picking your own punishment because then you are the one deciding your own fate. Cool. Are there any other questions that you guys have for Peter? Good morning, Peter. Hello. Hey, what is like one of your things that you do every morning, either when you're talking about becoming the knowledge agent, what's one of the things that you do as far as research or podcasts or what? Yeah, so I actually really started replacing listening to music in the car with podcasts about a year and a half ago. 
And I've realized that that's been a huge change in myself and my business and my personal growth where I don't really listen to music as much in the car or anywhere anymore. I just put on a podcast, whether it be a five, 10 minute, 20 minute podcast, something about motivation, business, you know, real estate, Tom Ferry podcast is great if you have a long drive. And I personally like a little bit more hardcore accountability. So if you like, you know, someone that's just straightforward and raw with what they say, Andy Frisella, he has a great podcast. That's what I usually listen to. As far as becoming the knowledge broker, I listen to a lot of the lenders that I have on Instagram. I watch their videos. I watch a lot of the realtors, what they're putting out there, what information is on the news, and then my interpretation of it. So if you ever watch some of my videos, it's always, you've been hearing about A going on. This is what the interpretation of it is. And this is how I potentially see it affecting you in the real estate market, right? Because people are hearing news and the news is out there to really get views. They're not going to go out and say, things are great. People are buying houses. They're going to go put out a headline that's going to scare the crap out of people. And that's what gets them views. Now, people here, you know, sales are down from last year. Of course, they're down from last year. We have less inventory and we have double the rates, so less people qualify. I go into simplifying that and breaking it down for my clients. If I'm doing something about the local real estate market, I'm going into the MLS, looking at what happened last month, looking at what's going on currently, and then making an interpretation of that. Thank you. No problem. All right. Anybody else have anything? Um, you you talked on farming a little bit, Peter. Yes. Uh, so for um, sorry, alarm in the background. Um, so for um, for you, I, I know, uh, and obviously we all know Nazar is is king of farming, right? Um, so for you, how long did you did you find? Did it take a year or two or three before you started to see? results coming at all from your farm so that's a great question i actually had a farm that was a complete disaster so i was basically going to be covering what not to do with the farm and tessa is going to cover what to do with the farm um, so we've gotten to know what that looks like for me i had a farm for about a year i will say in all honesty i was not consistent with it i was very consistent for the first three months and then it was sporadic after that it adds up in cost and time and what you do and another thing was i didn't pick a farm based around where I live, it was, you know, 20, 25 minute drive away from where I am. And so that allowed me to make more excuses about why I'm not going to do an event, why I'm not going to go door knocking there. So that's one thing. And the second thing was I picked a farm that was just way too big to manage. It was about 2,100 homes. And so that is very overwhelming cost wise, time wise, and the amount of work that you're going to put into it, where what you should do is just like Tessa, something that's close by, something that's local to you, you have to acknowledge the local audience in that farm based on the age demographic, right? Younger people don't even check their mail anymore. They don't read the mail. They don't look at letters, envelopes, postcards, any of it. They're going more of the digital route. So if you're going to pick a farm where the demographic is slightly younger, you're going to want to go the digital route. You go onto Google, you start putting ads, set your ad spend. You go and put YouTube banner ads where it just pops up as they're watching YouTube videos. And that's how you want to focus on that younger demographic. If you find a demographic in a farm where it's slightly elderly, that's what Tessa's farm mostly consists of. She lives in a gated community that's half 55 plus and the half is all ages. Majority of her business has been from the 55 plus because her postcards are being read and people are seeing her name, seeing her at their events, and they're calling her. So if you want to do that, you want to focus on a farm and then target the demographic based on how you think they'll best receive information. And in all honesty, she didn't see any results, I think, until about the fifth to sixth month in her farm. Thank you. Biggest mistake yeah. is that agents just send out one or two postcards and then just, oh, this is a waste of money. This is costing way too much. And then they disappear. But people don't start recognizing you until about eight touches. And they have to be within a short amount of time because then you become familiar. They want to know who is this? Why are they reaching out to me? What are they sending? And maybe it has some sort of value. Then you start incorporating the community. And then you start providing value and a call to action after you've earned their trust. Matt, do you guys do you guys have a lot, a lot of uh, vertical living? We, I mean, depending on where in Chicago uh, you're talking about, um, yeah, there, uh, there definitely are. I mean, I have some agent friends that that literally will farm just one building. Yeah, uh, you know, so there is some of that. Uh, where I live, we're just outside the city in Oak Park River Forest, mostly houses. Um, so I'd be, I'd be more traditional out here. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, like there is definitely some value in when, when you have more of like a very old demographic, like, I, I don't know if you're in your areas, you have people that have lived there for like 30, 40, 50 years. Um, that's when I think, you know, you can look into th those algorithms that, that, you know, may look at people that have been there for, you know, like signs in which people make moves based on life, you know, changes that, that can happen, right? And so a farm doesn't necessarily need to be just a geographic farm every house on the block, right? It could be very much targeted to a specific group, uh, you know, a, a specific demographic, or it could be, you know, um, looking at people that, you know, again, may have a kid or, or may be getting a divorce or maybe doing whatever those life events. And so you can target a geographic area, but then, you know, hone in your, your search and, and really dive deep into those people. And then your message to those people are a lot more clear than just some basic, hey, do you want to sell your house, right? Um, so just, you know, for those that want to, to explore that option, that is definitely something you can look into. It takes a little bit more planning, a little bit more structure, but at the end of the day, it could have, you know, really good results as well, because the message is very clear and succinct and to them specifically. That is the biggest thing that my coach was talking about is if you're going to farm a specific area, if you're going to target someone through social media, whatever it may be, even with your own Instagram profiles or social media profiles, make sure that you set the tone in your in your you know little intro line at the top. You have your name, what area you service, and what you will provide on that page. And your page has to be consistent with that theme, All right? So pick two to three things. Don't overwhelm yourself and focus on that. If you're going into a farm, be very laser focused on who your audience is and just know you're not going to capture everybody. Nazar, I think you send out, what, 60,000 postcards? Some are going to stick, some are not going to stick. Some people are going to resonate with the message in it. And those are the ones that you're going to have as part of your tribe. Yep. And, and I think it goes beyond the just the, the sending the mailers out, right? It's it's all of it together. It's the online, offline, the, the community events, all of it together, the signs, the open house signs, all of it is what creates an opportunity where people are like, oh yeah, this is clearly the right person or the obvious choice in, in, in helping someone make a move. So... All right. Any other thoughts before we end? Cool. All right, Peter. Well, thank you so much for giving us your your feedback and kind of you know what what it is that that makes you successful. I think having an accountability partner or having multiple accountability partners um, is a is a great way to be able to help you and also that other person. Um, I think you know you could have an, an accountability partner. You could have someone that you role play with, um, and and that those two people could be separate or it could be the same person. But at the end of the day, it's super important to be able to, you know, have someone that's going to hold your hand and, and you know, call you on your shit when, when you don't do what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And you, like you said, you just have to have someone that's going to call you on your shit. That's the most important thing. Yeah. yeah. All right, Peter, thank you so much for your time. You guys have an awesome yes. Thursday and rest of your weekend. We'll see you guys next week. Great job, Peter. Thank Bye. you, sir. Bye. Bye.